hello and welcome to episode whatever number it is of the digital <laughs> access show yes of lost count we've had some amazing guests last week we had a wonderful lady called meryl evans who is was born profoundly deaf and was very much of the she lived in lives in USA and we talked about the differences between the USA and Australia and digital accessibility and did a bit of a comparison and yeah shock of shock no surprises there there's not much difference and in reality it's going to be a long time before everyone uses digital accessible techniques this year this year this week I want to go to the other end of the spectrum my guest this week is a wonderful lady who I met through Studio Pilates. In reality, she actually is the owner of the Studio Pilates Hamilton Portside in Brisbane. I was going to say website, business. <laughs> and I do Pilates. And then when Amber and I started talking, we had a few other things in common. Amber Adcock, thank you. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. My pleasure to be here. I will tell you, Amber has rescued my shoes, rescued my sanity, made me laugh. But today we want to talk about something we both have in common. So, Amber, do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and then we can discuss what we've got in common? And I it's not vision. Do. It's not a vision. No. <laughs> So I have three children. Um, I've got Lily, who's seven, and I've got Hugo, who is nearly turning four in May. Um, and then we have little Freddie, who's our pocket rocket child. Um, and so Hugo, our middle child, he was born premature. He was born at 27 weeks. He was 940 grams which is tiny. Um, I think when you're thinking that's under a kilo at the time um, and it completely threw us that whole situation. Um, and, yeah, so I obviously own Studio Pilates at Hamilton. We've had that studio since 2021, I believe, if I'm thinking back correctly. It's been quite the right. Um, and, yeah. That's pretty much sums up me now. The thing we've got in common, though, is our middle kids. Yes. Yeah. Our little boys who are ASD. Um, so my Hugo, the 27-week preemie baby, he only recently has been diagnosed with um, autism, level three nonverbal. Yeah. Um and to get to that diagnosis was actually quite, oh, I'd like to say ride um, because there were no definitive answers. And as the mum, you sort of, you have a gut feeling and then you pay the professionals to be told otherwise and then you sleep at night because you're like, okay, well, you know, the one that went to university and who I've just paid $250 for, I said, no, he's fine, he's fine, so you let it go till the next thing or the next comment from a family member or a friend and then it's raised again um but yes getting that diagnosis although it was at the time um mourning a bit of a loss it was sad and it's hard to explain um I know there can be a lot of worse things that can happen but I think you just want the best for your child and then you know okay this isn't going to be easy for them um and no one sits you down and says, okay, here's your diagnosis. This is what you need to do. Like we were never given that. It was just, okay, so ASD, level three, that's the highest on the spectrum. He's nonverbal. I don't know if he will ever speak. It's too early to tell. That's a, a very common phrase, too early to tell, um, oh, which is yeah. hard to hear as a parent because you're like, okay, well, I understand that, but I'm just trying to map everything out in my head. Um, so you've you've really got, just got to live in the now. You've got these other children at the same time, yes. but you've still got to care for them and provide for them. 
So my story was a little bit later than yours. So Nick was nearly nine. And the only reason he was diagnosed is my oldest son is ADHD. And I took him to the developmental pediatrician. And of course, where he went, Nick, my other two sons went. And Nick was over in the corner doing whatever Nick was doing. And the developmental pediatrician looked at me and said, yeah, your oldest one's ADHD, but that one's Asperger's. And I went, oh, my gosh. Where's my husband? He's at work. How am I going to handle this? And my youngest one's sitting there just being David, and he says, oh, he's normal. And I said, well, what's normal? They're all normal. But it, it it is really, it's an awful feeling that first few months because you worry about where they're going to end up, where you're going to end up mentally and physically and emotionally. Yes. And what about the other kids and your husband and your marriage? And suddenly it all, to me, it nearly like it exploded a bit until I could say, pull your head in, settle pedal. Mm -hmm. which became my saying for a long time, settle, petal, and one step at a time. Yeah. yeah. That that expression, my person of that is Jed. He's the one who's always grounding and like when I'm getting upset, he'll say, yeah. you know, he's lucky to be alive. He's lucky to be here yeah. with us. This isn't the worst thing that we could deal with. And I'm like, yep, okay, bring myself back down. But it's still mm -hmm. okay to feel the way that we feel in terms of, you know, you worry about the other kids, you worry about yourself, your marriage, everything that you said, um, yeah. because it is a lot and you only want the best for your children, all of them, not just <laughs> singling out one. Yeah. What are the communication challenges that you're currently experiencing with Hugo? And I never use the word barrier because, a barrier is something that can't be fixed. It blocks mm -hmm. things. And I always say challenge because nine times out of ten, not all the time, but nine times out of ten, there is a way around it. So what are you experiencing at the moment, you and your husband with Hugo and your other two kids? Because it's I a family have, unit. Yes, I would have to say that... Um, Hugo is getting better. Um, we, I don't feel like we're in the worst of it at the moment, but what we're experiencing at the moment will probably be, I feel like Hugo knows in his mind more, like things that he wants, like he's got more drive to do or want things than he ever has, but he doesn't have the skill set to tell us, um, which is hard because, the you know, he will want something so randomly that he might have seen on TV mm. that's etched in his mind and he's like, okay, I'm going to do that. But we have no idea what he's talking about. So the frustration and the breakdown is massive. Um, and then obviously Freddie and Lily are on the receiving end of it as well. They're there watching him have a breakdown and I'm nearly borderline having a breakdown when, you know, you're trying to work out what he wants. Um, so I would definitely say that as he's getting older, he's exposed to more and he there's more things in his little mind that he wants to do that he just cannot communicate to us. Like it's not as simple as just I want toast, I want water, I want a milk. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it I do. Be, I do painting at kindy, so why are there no paints here? Or, you know, he'll grab a makeup brush of mine and think it's for painting. And yeah. then I'm trying to explain, no, that's not, I don't have paint. Yeah. And then it's a breakdown. Like it can be something so small. Um, and you don't want him to feel like you're disregarding that as well. So yeah. you try so hard to work it out with little clues. Um, but, yeah, that's probably the hardest thing at the moment. Yeah, I feel for you there because I had the same, and it, it it's it, it just you don't know where to go with that communication challenge because until he is able to become more verbal or until there is a way that he will react to, and it it all has to come from Hugo. It, it can't come from you saying to Hugo, "We're going to use that computer and do this." 
because there could be too much on the computer screen that will distract him from what you want him to do. Yeah. And that, you know, I know with Nick, well, we didn't have computers at that level back then because we're talking, you know, 20, 23 years ago. Oh, gosh, I feel old. But even then, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm definitely not old. But what I'm saying is the level of, activities on a computer back then definitely aren't what they are there now do you find with Hugh, uh, Hugo that if you're on a computer with Hugo or doing an activity on an iPad or something that he is very focused and he can do that quite happily or is there something with Hugo I know for Nick it was Thomas the Tank Engine and there was this show called Hooli Dooley and it was I those two things. <laughs> yeah, well, that was sorry. I'm I'm over hooli dooly, so don't dare sing it. So it was a weird one, that one. <laughs> it was. I think the hammer went through the the video cassette after after about forty on one day over and over again, but it settled him. But Nick, the other one was AFL. Would you believe? AFL was the difference with Nick. He could sit and watch an AFL game as a four or five-year-old. And he loved it. Yeah. And, and it was always the Lions. I'm sorry. It was no Melbourne teams. It was no anything else. It was the Lions. And he was fascinated. And that's where his speech started coming in. Because we ended up having to use things like AFL. What about there you? You, you notice things with Hugo that you can say, well, maybe that's a channel in. Um, he has his iPad and I can tell you now that I have never seen a three-year-old so good on an iPad, oh iPad God. or phone. And um, I think one thing we've noticed lately is he really is loving watching back videos of himself. And there's almost this element of he will grab my hands to film him and he will do something and have a little smile on his face and then he'll rewatch it. Mind you, he'll rewatch it probably 25 times <laughs> um, on full volume, but that's fine. Um, yeah. That repetitive behaviour. He does love um, his, there's a Thomas game that he's just gotten into and he started saying all the um, Thomas the Tank Engine's names. So it's like yeah. Mia. Percy, Thomas, and then he'll actually have his iPad there and line his trains up and push one by one and say the names, which has only been a new thing, but it's stemmed from the repetitive mm. Thomas the Tank Engine game, hearing that because it says at the same time, in the same order every single time, as we all know, but we're just so used to it. It's background noise. Um, so, yeah, we have noticed that. and. He does love, and this is probably frowned upon parenting, YouTube kids, although we have had to ban a few of the shows that he will watch because he will yeah. watch Bluey in Japanese. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just like, all right, we're, we're trying to speak here. We don't need you to start speaking Japanese. Uh, English would be great. Um, oh, so, I love yeah. it. I know, and he will be obsessed with it. Like he'll put on ABC ABC Kids iView app, he'll put Bluey on and somehow manage to change it to Japanese. And I don't know how, but whatever works. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we do notice the repetitive watching or playing of games like that's helping with some of his speech. Yeah. So, yeah. We found the same. and But with us, it was Jonathan Brown, Jason Akamanis, um, Michael Voss. Oh, my God. All, <laughs> it, and... And I'd sit there and think. On repeat. <laughs> on repeat. And I'd sit there and think, oh, my gosh, I can say to this child, what do you want for lunch? And it, the only thing he'd say was what Peter says, Peter's my oldest son, and Peter would go, Nick wants a peanut plate. Uh, no, Nicholas has got to ask. But if <gasps> he'd be watching footy, Michael Voss, Akamanis. And they, oh, gosh, so. <laughs> that AFL, sorry, so we cute. weren't going to talk AFL, but it does. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Here we go. AFL's had a big, profound effect on him. And one of the things I really noticed when Nick went to school, and it was Nick was 
obviously he had the problems all along, but when Nick did start school, he had big challenges with writing because he didn't have the fine motor skill that you need to yeah. write and like to run. He didn't have the strength, the muscle strength, because he was very low muscle tone and yeah. all these things. And where that impacted, obviously, with his communication, with his writing, with his education, it was a massive problem for us. Mm. So, yeah, how I mean, for you, it's a different era because it's going to be a lot more laptop. And obviously, Hugo's already got it. He's got his iPad worked out. So there's a lot more help. And I'm really pleased about that for you. What What's the rules and what's the ages that these kids go to school now? Because, what, he's nearly four. So... Yeah. How do you how do you anticipate managing that education process with the extra communication needs that he's going to have and the accessibility needs? Yeah, so we're in that, just circling back to that phrase, it's too soon to tell, we've been yep. hearing that. Um, so obviously you would love for your child to go on into mainstream schooling, mm -hmm. like especially with his sister and his brother. Um, yeah. We don't know if that will be the case. And admittedly, nowadays there is a lot more support in schools um, mm. for children on the spectrum um, and all special needs. Um, but it's whether or not you want to put them in that position because I felt like when we had Hugo, so Hugo's in an ABA therapy, mm. I think I mentioned to you, um, yeah. he started there in Feb this year and honestly he is really starting to thrive from that um yes. which is amazing like it's been such a short time but he will um a classic example they've been doing a countdown thing with him because he's a million miles an hour like he's one thing to the next yeah won't wait if you say just wait mm. um and admittedly, that's probably my fault too, a little bit, because I'm like, okay, don't have a breakdown here. What do you want? Have this, Lily, get yeah. that, Freddie, out of the way, like just yeah. avoid the breakdown. Yeah. Um, but we're able to count down from 25 to zero and make him stop and wait, and he will have eye contact with us. Oh, wow. While we're counting down, which is huge. They started that from five. Yeah. Um, and then they've worked their way up to 25, which is amazing. Like, for example, the morning toast, mm. I'll pop the toast down and normally he will press the blue button to flick it back up. And I'm like explaining, which obviously is not going through to him yeah. at all. Like you you can't have just bread. Like it's got a toast, you've got to leave it down there. Anyway, so we use the countdown in the morning so he will wait. And then as soon as I get to zero and then he says press, and I say, yes, you can press it now and he'll press it. Mm. Um, so that's been a huge change for him. Um, and I can't wait to see what else will happen over the next few months because it's already been such a short time frame that we're seeing these changes. But um, I think I did mention to you, and I'm getting a little bit off track, is we initially, when we had the diagnosis, we're like, okay, great, you know, we'll do an extra speech mm. um, therapy session. We'll do another OT session thinking, oh, these are all helping, but they actually won't. And no discredit to these people, but for a three-year-old to be attentive and sit through a 45-minute session, you know, at whatever time you could just pick up because you're like, I want to get them there. They may be tired as heck, yeah. but you think, oh, they need this, and then, you're flustered, they're flustered, yeah. no one wants to be there and then you go away feeling really defeated, you're trying to implement what they've told you in that 45-minute session and it's just too hard. Yeah, and, and, it's and not it puts a lot of pressure on the family. Yes, yeah. and, and it, it is. is. And it's also, I noted when Nick was going through it, it was very overwhelming for Nick. Yeah. To the, there was just too much information given too quickly. Yes, 100%. And then it was, oh, we'll change the approach because we've been doing this for six months and, you know, he's not picking up what we're putting down. And I'm like, well, I'm barely picking up what you're putting down in these yeah. sessions. You know, it's a lot. It's really hard and fast. And mm -hmm. then it's disheartening because, you you know, you're doing it for six or 12 months 
this little two, three-year-old and you think that you're failing because you're like, okay, am I not trying hard enough at home? But then you're like, well, I'm not, you know, a therapist or I'm not, I, this isn't me. But when you think about it, if you, and, and you're, you're a bit younger than me, but even like now, if I go and I've got to go to a webinar or something, is, is if everything's given at once, really rushed you never ever take it all in you can't so for a two or three year old child how can they if you as an adult wouldn't do it that expectation on the child is quite huge and that's where their communication and I look I'm only speaking from my experience okay yeah. it's not anyone else's but my experience at that time was Nick would just shut down. Yes. So I don't and want to do this. Similar to Hugo. Yes. Yeah. Too much, too overwhelming. I once had a doctor say to me, and it was the best description I've heard of Asperger's, which is probably similar to, I think it's at a similar level. Mind you, you wouldn't think it if you saw my Nick now, is he, it's like being in a room where everyone's talking at once with the same level of intensity the same tone of voice and everyone's message is important. Yep. How are you going to get, be able to filter out what is important which versus what can be put aside and dealt with later? Yeah. And, and I that's thought that was 100%. Yeah. And that's because, hard. Like that's hard for their little mind. Yeah. As well. Like they're so young and they don't know any different as well. Um, which is and, hard, but but every step of their day is learning with smell and touch and sound and you know words and sight and everything. So the messages they're getting from every part of them would be all consuming. Yes, and overwhelming. And you, it's yeah. any wonder they have these meltdowns when Hugo's melting down and he can't tell me. I'm thinking okay, this is valid because I'm feeling like I'm going to have a meltdown in a minute. Um, and it's a lot of patience as well, which being a parent, you have to be patient. But I feel like it's a whole new level of patience, especially if it was probably just Hugo, it might be a little bit different. But, um, you know, there's other children yeah. that you have to worry about as well. So, um, yeah, circling back to what he's doing at the moment, it's called applied behaviour analysis. Now, it's very intense, um, but in saying that we've seen nothing but great results so far, yeah. and I think that it suits Hugo especially, and we're only speaking from our experience, yeah. um, because they did a slow transition with him into the centre. It's four days a week. It's um, nine to four. So it's pretty hectic. Um, yeah. He's got a team of four. He's got a behaviour specialist, a speechy, um, and then two other little carers who they're all so lovely with him. Um, and we're at a point now where this morning, for example, dropped to go off, he put his backpack on, met one of his um, teachers, held her hand, walked in, turned around, waved at me halfway, yeah. huge, which is so different to the experience mm -hmm. we had with him in mainstream daycare because we kept telling ourselves, oh, well, if you surround him um, with other children, you know, who essentially aren't autistic or whatever, like it will help him, but yeah. I think it actually made him regress a little bit because, you know, I would get the updates on the app um, from the daycare and I'd be looking, thinking, okay, where's Hugo? You know, he's not participating in any of the group time, yeah. which is so sad as a parent to think, okay, and they're just not equipped to cater for Hugo, I yeah. think. Um, so you can, through NGIS, get an additional person at the daycare yep. you can apply for it um but that mm. person i found out is not specific to hugo it's just extra hands in the room oh okay. which i yep. thought i was like okay great but that doesn't really give him that one-on-one -on -one that he needs um and we didn't know about this aba therapy at all until 
Institute, the CEO of North Melbourne got us onto it. Um, it's actually located right near Jed's work as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we were like, oh, you know, this sounds a bit intense. Um, I don't know if that's for Hugo. Like that's our first yep. take back. And you do some research and you do find a few negative um, comments about this style of therapy, but they love Hugo and they incorporate learning into play and that's what Hugo needs and it's all at his level, at his pace. Like they don't push anything. He's happy to go there, which I think is a great sign. Yeah. Um, and it's goal setting specific to Hugo. So there's a lot of other um, children there. Obviously everyone's different, but it's all very specific to that child, which I think is so important. There's no one size fits all. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because that's what it is with everyone. There is no one size fits all. The fact that they've worked out the best way to communicate with Hugo and they're using those techniques and those strategies, it, it, that's awesome stuff because I think that's what people forget, isn't it? Everyone's different. Yeah. And one of the big things that for me when I took Nick anywhere was I would get, you know, they would have meltdown. And mm -hmm. I think, just don't make assumptions. Yeah. You know, don't make assumptions. I mean, my boys used to be altar servers and they nearly had a fight on the altar one day because they were rostered on together. Two autistic boys rostered on together. Oh, my gosh. And I'm sitting down in the congregation thinking, this is not going to be pretty. But the priest... Let them work it out. <laughs> no, not on the altar. You're halfway through mass, no, no. The priest dealt with it. But you know what? They're normal kids. And the moment people start making assumptions about anyone, and it's not just them, it could be assumptions about Lily or Freddie or you or your husband, about yep. me and what I'm capable of or not capable of, I think that harms our society straight off. Yep, it does. Um, yeah. I mean, I've got to admit, that's one of the things I like about going to your studio is the notes are there for your staff to say, oops, here she comes, don't touch the dog, <laughs> dog goes in the corner, Narelle will tell you what she can't do. But, you know, they ask the question. Yeah. And that is the best part, just asking a question, isn't it? Yeah. Or and I think keep that's walking and thing. leave it. Yeah. I, I encourage questions because I've got friends who have three-year-olds and um, I've, I've probably only got a small group of people that I could ever leave Hugo mm. with um, just because we're sort of at that level of it, it can be overwhelming for someone to think, okay, I don't know what he wants. Um, but God bless Hugo. Uh, Freddie and Lily will speak on his behalf, um, yes. as you've mentioned that before. Yeah. Um, so that's always reassuring. But, yeah, I think asking questions is needs to be encouraged more. Yeah. So really what we're saying is communication will happen for Freddie, oh, for Hugo, for Freddie. Freddie's already got it. But for Hugo, it will happen in Hugo's time mm -hmm. and it will happen the best way that works for Hugo, which is exactly the same way as all of us, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly right. We always say he's running his own race um, and he'll get there. And he is such a good kid. Like he's really sweet. And I just, I can't believe, you know, all the time that we spent in therapy over the probably past 18 months um, forcing these ways on Hugo thinking, okay, it's gonna, you know, he'll start speaking next month. You know, that's what I kept telling myself. Like that's all. I wanted, I, I thought, yeah. okay, I just want to be able to have a conversation with him. Because yeah. you'll see other three-year-olds having little conversations and now I've sort of accepted. I'm like, okay, well, we'll get there. May not may not get there in done soon, but we will. So, Amber, what's the takeaway? What's the message you want to give people out of all of this? So we've been discussing communication, which is obviously what I'm big about. And the fact I've only got four senses. Hugo's probably got about a thousand senses. 
you go the yes. complete opposite <laughs> to me. I know my son Nick has probably got two thousand senses. You know, it's what it yeah. is. But we're saying everyone's different. You've only probably got five or six. So we're lacking really compared to Hugo. Yeah. What's the message? What do you want to tell people about a child that is ASD level three? They're perfect mm -hmm. people. There's they are perfect. Different. They're not they're not any different to anyone else. They've just got a different skill set. Mm -hmm. Um I think kind would come to mind I think you know when you see someone whether it's like in my situation with a child having a breakdown um, because they can't communicate don't stare you know what I mean yeah. smile um, which I do often get I'll get a smile or you know um, we've got our local petrol station that we go to and Hugo has to go in there and get a Hot Wheels car nearly all the time and they just expect it yeah. Um, and they they don't expect any acknowledgement from Hugo. He'll just throw it up on the counter and wait for it to be paid for. Um, <laughs> but I think kindness and I, as a mum, on sort of flipping it over, I think you've got to trust your gut as well. If you think, okay, something's not right, like just keep pushing for an answer um, and do your research as well. I think yeah. I didn't know half the stuff I know now. Um, about autism and ways to help and yeah like as I said at the start no one sits you down and says okay this is your diagnosis here's the textbook on how we're going to help you with this um it's sort of a you've got to figure it out you've got to figure out how it works for Hugo so yeah yeah and I think you're right and I think people need to remember Hugo communicates in Hugo's way Yes. And Hugo's way is very different to mine. It's different to yours. And my son, Nick, it's different to the way my son, Nick, communicates. Different yeah. to the way the bloke at the petrol station that gets the Hot Wheels dumped on his counter. <laughs> They're happy. Yeah. You know, yes. and it's all good. If there's no yeah. rudeness, and look, they're kids. They're going to be rude at times. Yeah. Yes. Expect yeah. it. But communication is still possible differently. Yep. Think outside the square. It's the, I think the extra thing I would add, you know, let the kids think outside the square and you need to think outside the square yourself because if we don't think outside the square, we're the ones that are missing out. Not Hugo. Yeah. Hugo's yeah. going to have a good old time. No, I definitely agree with that. And it comes in all forms too. I remember recently catching a flight. I was by myself. I saw this. Mum, she had a little, she was by herself, had her baby in the carrier and we're going through security mm. and, you know, she just gave me the look and I said to her, would you like me to hold your baby so you can get your carrier back on? And she's like, thank you so much. And I just think like we just had to look at each other, mum to mum, and there was that yeah. communication of, okay, I'm going to help you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 Thanks, Amber. Some takeaways. <laughs> Actually, I'll add one more. Just don't make assumptions. Never yes, assume. Yes, love that. Never assume. Never, as never Jen says, assume. or you make an ass out of you. Bingo. <laughs> There's the takeaway point. <laughs> and number two, don't let Hugo watch AFL or, well, actually, no, Akamanis and Jonathan Brown and Michael Voss, they're all. No longer. <laughs> no longer. Thank God. No, it's it's Freddie we'll have to worry about. He will sit through a whole game. He's next oh, level. So Yeah, good luck. Totally different kids they are. Their kids. Thanks, Amber. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, well. And that's another episode of the Digital Access Show. So next week we've gone, we've had a chat with Amber about her wonderful son Hugo. Next week is this lovely, lovely lady called Laura Garcia. And Laura has a daughter, a wonderful daughter that's just started high school. And Eva has no sight. And Eva is a Harry Potter fan. And the way Eva and Laura have managed education so that Eva is just excelling. And it's all about accessibility and it's all about communication. So see you next time. 
Thanks for listening to us today. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you really love what we're doing, and we hope you do, we hope you find the videos of interest, please like, subscribe, and share to everyone, and leave a Google review. See you next time.